Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be in your presence. The Bible says, where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst. And so, Lord, we acknowledge your presence among us today, and we appreciate your presence. We pray specifically that your Holy Spirit, the teacher, will be at work in our hearts, speaking to our hearts the things that you want us to hear tonight. We bless you and thank you, committing this study to you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, that your name will be glorified in what we hear today and what you'll be doing in our lives individually and collectively. All these things we pray in the precious and powerful name of your Son, who is seated at your right hand, right now interceding for us and preparing a place for us, that when he has finished preparing a place for us, he will come and take us to be with him for all eternity. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, many will remember the fall season of 2008 as the beginning of the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression of 1929. In the months that follow, many lost their jobs, their homes, and their invest investments. Perhaps you are among some of the people that lost your investments. In a BBC interview a year later, Alan Greenspan, former head of the US Federal Reserve, indicated that the average person doesn't believe it will happen again. And he said this, and let me quote him, that that is the unquenchable capa capability of human beings when confronted with long periods of prosperity to presume that it will continue. You see, friends, assuming that things will continue as they've always been is not just 21st century type thinking. In the first century, Apostle Peter wrote of people who thought that life would continue as it was and that Jesus would not return. But you see, Jesus' delay is only because of God's patience with people. It is not his desire for any should perish and his righteous judgment, but that all should turn to him in faith and repentance. So this brings me to the main idea of the message God has given me to deliver to you today from his word at this special hour in your life and my life. So please listen carefully to it, not just with your head, but more importantly with your heart, where the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, is desirous and determined to plant the seed of God's unfailing and unchanging word in order to conform genuine believers more and more into the blessed image of Jesus Christ, who is the ruler and redeemer of the church, and to convict the unbelieving of their sin of unbelief, graciously and gently leading them to repentance and genuine saving faith in Jesus Christ, who is the rescuer and ransom for sinners. So here is the message in a nutshell. Nutshell. Please listen to it, pay attention to it with an open heart and an open mind. God, listen, is not bound to a human schedule, but is patiently waiting for sinners to turn to him. Let me repeat it again. God is not bound to a human schedule, but is patiently waiting for sinners to turn to to him. Folks, friends, faithful followers of Christ among us here today, and fellow believers in the fold and flock, fellowship and family of God, the Bible is going to vividly make it clear to us today that the, that time, listen, is not the same to God as it is to man. He does not live in the sphere of time as we do. The Bible is also going to impress upon our hearts that God is not slow in fulfilling his promise, 
but rather he is so, so patient. So please, if you have your Bibles, turn them to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. Would you please listen carefully as I recite this passage of study from the updated New American Standard Bible, which is the most literal translation of the Bible into our English language. Actually, I'll be reciting from the very first verse of chapter 3. The Bible says, This is not beloved, the second letter I am writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Now to our passage of study, verse 8 to 10, the Bible says, but let, but do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And the heavens, oh, in which the, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. This is the word of God to the people of God. May the Lord add to the, to the recital of his holy word. We have before us a passage of scripture that vividly presents to us the lordship and longing of Jesus Christ. First of all, it vividly points to the lordship of Jesus Christ because, listen, it gloriously promotes the lordship of Jesus Christ in this passage. But you ask, how is the lordship of Jesus Christ gloriously promoted in this brief passage? Please listen carefully. If you have your Bibles, you will notice that the expression, the Lord, is mentioned in each verse. Verse, verse 8, verse 9, and verse 10. The repetition is not just to fill the pages of the Bible, but to emphasize the lordship of the divine person of Jesus Christ. He is indeed the Lord of the universe. You see the Lord in these verses, that is verse 8 to, to 10, is none other than the person of Jesus Christ in his exaltation. So as you read these verses, think of Jesus exalted as the Lord of the universe. Peter loves to speak of Jesus as the Lord, thus promoting his lordship. Well, second, this passage vividly reveals to us the longing of Jesus because, listen again, it graphically portrays 
the longing in God's heart to wait patiently for sinners to turn to him in faith and repentance. I tell you, friends, the Bible is going to explain to us today that the apparent delay of Christ's return was not an evidence of God's indifference or lack of power. In fact, the apparent delay of the promise of Jesus' return is redemptive in purpose. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, it is to allow more people to turn from their sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ before God's righteous judgment comes upon the world. How patient and how long-suffering is the Lord our God. Personally, I thank God for his patience with me because he waited and waited and waited, waited till I responded to the call of the Holy Spirit to believe in Jesus Christ. If he didn't exercise patience, he could have taken me right away in my sins. And you should also be grateful for the patience of God and his dealings with you. Well, having simply whetted your spiritual appetite, which I hope you have a healthy spiritual appetite, just as you have a healthy spiritual ap appetite for natural food, <laughs> I hope you have a good one for the Bible study of the Word of God. Please allow me to give you a brief overview of how the Holy Spirit has prepared me to present this passage to you from beginning to the end. First of all, we will discuss the Bible's teaching regarding the perspective of time from God's viewpoint in verse 8. What is God's perspective of time? Have you ever pondered that question? I tell you, friends, the Bible is going to make it plain to us today that God does not view time as we humans do. God is not bound by earthly time. God is not bound to a human timetable. He doesn't need to worry about time. Why? The Bible tells us one day to him is like a thousand years. And a thousand years like one day. Well, second, we will consider what the Bible teaches about the patience of God in verse 9. I tell you, folks, the Bible is going to present us with the divine response concerning the apparent delay in the fulfillment of the promise of Christ's return. And what is that divine response? What well, is because God is long-suffering. It's because God is incredibly patient towards sinners. Although God has, has sovereign and supreme authority to judge wayward, wicked, wretched, woeful sinners like myself instantly, yet he patiently waits and waits for them to turn from their sins to the Savior who is Jesus Christ. This is why the Bible is going to make it vividly clear to us that it is not that God is slow in fulfilling the promise of Christ's return, but rather he is incredibly patient. Third and finally, we will examine the Bible's prediction of the day of the Lord in verse 10. I tell you, fellow believers, Second Peter, as we have learned so far, is a book of prediction. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, so far, 2 Peter predicted the coming of false teachers among the churches who secretly introduced what? Destructive or damnable heresies in, into the churches. We saw that in chapter 2 verse 1. It also predicted the coming of mockers who mock the promise of the return of Jesus Christ. That was what we looked at in our previous study, chapter 3 verse 3 to 4. Now in chapter 3 verse 10, it predicts what? The coming of the day of the Lord. Now the question is, what is the day of the Lord? Is it a 24 hour period like we know the day to be? How will the day of the Lord come? What major events 
will take place on the day of the Lord? Well, these are crucial questions the Bible itself will answer for us. Well, having given you a concise overview of our passage of study, let's now dig deeper to discover the precious and timeless lessons and principles the Holy Spirit is enthused to impress upon our hearts in order to do his work of trans transforming us more and more into the blessed image of Jesus Christ. So we first begin, first of all, with his teaching focusing on the perspective of time from God's viewpoint in verse 8. Please let this be clear to you and me. The Lord's perspective of time is different from that of humans. In other words, time is not the same to God as it is to mankind. God is timeless. He does not live in a sphere of time as we do. He lives outside the dimension of time. After all, think of this. He has eternity behind him and eternity ahead of him. And so in responding to the scoffers scoffing at the apparent delay of the Lord's coming, the Holy Spirit led Peter to appeal to the teaching of the oldest psalm in the Bible, that is Psalm 90, to make it clear to the scoffing false teachers that they overlooked God's time perspective. You see, they were mocking God that he was delaying. But now Peter, led by the Spirit of God, says, let this be clear to you. You are missing one point. You are missing the point that time is not the same to God as it is to you. You see, the mockers not only overlooked God's personal intervention in history through the creation and the flood, they also overlook his time perspective. And so in Psalm 90 verse 4, Moses, the prophet of God, the servant of God, the man of God, says in the spirit these words in Psalm 90. Because this is where Peter got this message, this teaching from. In Psalm 90 verse 4, as Moses was praying, he says, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or as a watch in the night. So this is where Peter got this idea of a thousand years. Actually, Psalm 90 verse 4, to which Peter alludes, was used in Jewish literature to deal with the problem of the apparent delay in the fulfillment of God's promises. And so referring, referring to the believers a second time as beloved, in verse 8, Apostle Peter explains to them that the delay of the second coming is not a long time from God's perspective. Notice what he says. And he says, but do not let this one fact escape your notice, that, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. Now, please listen. The Bible is making it clear to us here that what was regarded as a long time to people was like a mere day in God's reckoning. In other words, from man's viewpoint, Christ's promise coming seems like a long time away. 2,000 years for us is a long time away. But from God's viewpoint, it will not be long. Why? It's because God is not bound by earthly time. He doesn't wake up and say, oh, this morning, today is, it's now 6 o'clock in the morning here in my temple in heaven. What are we going to do when it's 12 o'clock? <laughs> he doesn't think in those terms. We think in those terms. In fact, God Almighty 
the eternal and everlasting God stands above time with the result that when time is seen in the light of eternity, an age appears no longer than one short day. And a day seems no shorter than a long age. So you see, what the Bible is teaching us here is that the eternal God, listen carefully, can expand a day into a millennium. And he can compress, listen, a millennium into a day. This is what the Bible is teaching us. So see the expansion and the compression. If God chooses, he could compress 3,000 years into one single day. And if he chooses, he could expand one single day into thousands of years. All this is to say that God just is not on our timetable. Now, an important question arises at this point because it will help us to understand what the Bible is saying here. And that is, how do we determine time? From our point of view, how do we determine time? Well, we determine time by the relationship of the sun to the earth. That is why we talk of the sun rising in the morning and the sun setting in the evening. Guess what? The everlasting God is not limited by this relationship. One writer says this, and I find it very interesting. He says, since time is purely relative with God, he waits patiently while human beings stew with impatience. Most of us here are impatient, but God is patient because time is relatively relative to him. Now, will you please be reminded here that the admonition, do not let this one fact escape your notice, is addressed to who? It is addressed to believers who are secondly, for the second time called beloved. The original reads, this one thing, let not be concealed from you, beloved. The, the inter interesting thing here is that this admonition uses the same word that is used of the mockers' deliberate forget forgetfulness in verse 5. Remember in verse 5 it says, when they maintain this, it escapes their notice. So the word that is being talked about here is, it escapes their notice. In the Greek is lathano. It also means to be hidden, escape someone's notice, lose sight of, ignore, be unaware, or forget. So that's why the King James translate is, be not ignorant of this. So one of the translation of that word, lathano, is ignore. So that is why the King James says, be not ignorant of this one thing. And the NIV says, do not forget what this one thing. You see, the scoffers deliberately overlooked, ignored, forgot the fact that God personally intervened in history through creation and the flood. So the point the Holy Spirit is seeking to impress upon your heart and my heart is that the believers must be very careful lest the propaganda of the scoffers distort their thinking about the Lord's return. That's their goal. They want to distort your thinking and my thinking about the teaching of Jesus' re return so they can confuse you and take advantage of you. And so the Bible is saying to, to Christians, Christians must not lose sight of Christ's return. They must not forget that Jesus is coming indeed. They must not be duped into thinking that this, the coming of Jesus Christ, is a fable. 
they must be fully aware that his return is a faithful truth revealed by the faithful God who is the only true God of the universe. So please, believers in Jesus Christ, consider these questions. Are you living with the realization that time is short and that you have an important work to do? Remember the one day in the year thousand? Are you ready to meet Jesus Christ anytime, even today? And are you also planning your course of service as though he may not return for many years to come? Remember, with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. While still replying to the charge of the scoffers that the expectation of the Lord's coming has been disproved by the delay, the Holy Spirit now leads Peter to make it clear to all who have ears to hear and has to respond to his message that God's delay is actually gracious. It is not caused by his inability or indifference at all. That is why the Holy Spirit reveals that God's time plan for the fulfillment of the promise of Christ's return is influenced by the patience of God. In verse 8. So this is the focus of our second major teaching point. May I say to us that God's seeming, seeming delay in bringing human history as we know it to an end is a result not of indifference but of patience in waiting for all who will come to repentance. And nowhere in this is this truth and teaching vividly captured than in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. I tell you, friends, this is one of the most blessed and beloved verses in all of the Bible. It is one of the Bible verses that should be memorized by every single believer in Jesus Christ. In fact, this verse is on the same level or scale as John 3, 16. John 3, 16 says what? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have what? Eternal life or everlasting life. Now please listen to what Peter says in chapter 3 verse 9 of his second letter. The Bible says the Lord is not slow about his promise. As some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Notice the John 3:16 and 2 Peter 3:9. Notice they both use the word perish. In John 3:16, it says. It, is, it says, shall not perish. In 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, no wishing for any to perish. That is why I said to you that they are on the same level as far as God's redemptive purpose for sinners is concerned. God has promised, listen, to end the history of ungodly men with his righteous judgment to be executed at the return of the righteous judge, the Lord Jesus Christ, into whose hand the Father has committed all judgment. You see, the scoffers argue that God was slow to keep his promise of the return of Christ. But the Holy Spirit, speaking through Apostle Peter, strongly and soundly, soundly refuted the argument, saying, God is not slow. God is not slack. God is not loitering. God is not late. God is not negligent about performing his promise. He says, God is not hesitating as if he doesn't know what he's doing. He says, God is not holding back from fulfilling his promise. 
He says, sovereignty, not slowness, is the issue at stake. He says, because God is long-suffering, God, he says, is patient. Although the sovereign and supreme deity of the universe has every right, listen, he has every right to bring his righteous judgment upon wayward and wretched sinners like myself and to bring it quickly without warning and without waiting any second longer. Yet the Bible tells us he chooses to what? Exercise what? His patience toward sinners. This, I tell you, friends, is the good news of the gospel. It is the good news of amazing grace. You see, the scoffers totally misunderstood the reason for the apparent divine delay in fulfilling the promise of the Lord's return. They failed miserably in their understanding of the character of God. They didn't know or understand that God is a long-suffering God. When they were mocking, where is the promise of his coming? They didn't take into cons consideration the character of God. Who is this God we are mocking? And the one thing Peter reveals to us is that the God the false teachers and the mockers were mocking is a God of what? Long suffering. It's a long suffering God. So I want us to say this together. That is, I'll say the first one and then I'll help you repeat it because it's the heart of the message today. God is a long-suffering God. That is the first one. So remember, God is a long-suffering God. Let's all say it together. God is a long-suffering God. And the second one is, is easier. God is a God of patience. God is a God of patience. Actually, God's patience or long suffering in the Greek microthermia is an attribute prominent in Scripture. And there are many places where it speaks about God being patient. And I hope, remember, one of the fruits of the Spirit is what? Patience. And God wants you to exercise that patience in your love, in your life. Now in, uh, in Romans chapter 2, the Bible speaks of this patience of God to sinners like us. As Paul was led to write to the, the Jews and, and Gentiles as well in the church of Rome. He says in chap chapter 2 verse 4, or do you, do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? My friend, don't ever forget the patience of God. <laughs> Had it not been the patience of God, Many of us will not be here today. One writer vividly captures the, the essence of the patience of God in this lucid and liberating voice. And I quote him. He says, God endures endless blasphemies against his name, along with rebellion, murders, and the ongoing breaking of his law, waiting patiently while he's calling and redeeming his own. It is not impotence or slackness that delays his final judgment. It is patience. End quote. Please never forget what the Bible is stressing here to us. It is not that God is slow in fulfilling his promise, but rather that he is patient. So if you want to blame anything, why God hasn't Church the world at this time, you have to deal with his patience. Because that's the reason why he hasn't done what he promised to do. He is patient. 
patient, waiting for people to turn. The Lord of the promise does not delay. Now the question is, what's the primary reason for God's long-suffering character? Why has he chosen to be patient toward man mankind? Well, the Bible itself gives us a clear and concise answer at the end of verse 9, which literally reads, not purposing any to perish, but all men to come to repentance. This is translated in the New American Standard Bible as not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. The Greek word translated purposing or wishing, buleminos, buleminos, also means wanting, desiring, be willing, intending or planning. It speaks of decisions of the will after previous deliberations. It is used here of God's desirative will, not of his decretive will. See, there are things that God decrees and there are things that God desires. They are different. And sometimes we need to understand that God's desires are not the same as his decrees. Now, so the Bible is saying here that after his careful deliberations, God has decided, listen, he says after he made his deliberation, he had decided not to quickly bring the present period of history to an end because he does not wish that any should perish. Any should perish. So you can see God on his throne making the decision after careful deliberation that I am not going to bring judgment or end this world quickly because I'm deciding, desiring that people should not perish. Actually, the word for perish, apolumai, in this context also means to be lost, to be eternally ruined. You see, God doesn't want people to be eternal losers. So please let this be clear to us. God's so-called slowness is actually, listen, providing time for to wayward sinners to turn from their sins to the Lord Jesus. So the delay of Christ's return is the redemptive in purpose, as I said earlier in my message. It is to allow more people to believe in the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins before God's righteous judgment comes. So if you have family members who have, who have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, what the first thing you should be saying to God today is that, God, I thank you for your patience, that you have not judged my family members because you are not wishing for them to perish. You are giving them opportunity. So in other words, God is giving the world ample opportunity to repent and turn to him. You see, God knows humans will continue to be as sinful as ever. But God bound himself to withholding his full judgment so that he could show grace in Jesus Christ to them. Therefore, no one will be able to stand before God and say, well, God, you didn't give me opportunity to believe in Jesus Christ. It was your fault that I didn't believe in Jesus Christ. No, the Bible is telling us here, God has given us opportunity to believe in his turn because of his patience. I tell you, friends, so wonderful is God's love toward mankind that he will have them all to be saved and is of his own self prepared to bestow salvation on the lost. That is, those who repent, those who have a change of heart or a change of mind or those who turn from their sin, making an about turn, a 180 degrees turn from their sins to the Savior Jesus Christ. You see, in the days of Noah, which we looked at in chapter 2, God waited how many years? 120 years before he sent the flood. 
Now, today, he has waited, what, several thousand years before destroying the world with fire. So you can see the patience of God. He says, I want all to repent, to come to that repentance. Actually, the word all, panta, refers to all who come to Jesus Christ to make up the full number of the people of God. So the reason for the delay in Christ's coming and the attendant judgments is not because God is slow to keep his promise, as we made clear, or because he wants to judge more of the wicked people, or because he is impotent in the face of wickedness, he delays his coming because he is patient and desires the time for all who have been appointed to eternal life to repent or make an about, about turn from their sins to the Savior Jesus Christ. Actually, God's desire for people to repent rather than perish is vividly expressed in other scriptures of the Bible. Uh, there are so many scriptures, but for the sake of time, I will just read one for us. In Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, speaking to the people of God in Babylon, in chapter 33, he says this, in verse 11, He says, Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Listen, that's God saying, speaking. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And then he goes on to say, But rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then would you die, O house of Israel? So if God had delighted in the death of the wicked, he would not need to give us that word. He would just go and kill them, zap them. But that is not his delight. Please listen carefully now as I bring this message to a close. As believers in Jesus Christ, I believe we all here long for the return of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and the defeat of all evil. That's what we are longing for, a day when evil will be defeated once and for all. We long for that day, and the only one who can make it possible is not the politicians on, in the White House or in, over there in Great Britain. The only person that can make that possible is the Lord Jesus. His return will result in the total and sound defeat of all evil. But please don't make, miss this crucial application point. As long as the present period of history lasts, an opportunity remains for people to turn to Jesus Christ in faith for the forgiveness of all their sins. This is the reason why you and I, believers in Jesus Christ, need to share the good news of the Word of God. Why is sharing the good news of the Word of God important? Please listen. It is, only, it is the only thing that can change hearts and lives. It is by the Word of God, empowered by the Spirit of God, that sinners are born again. In 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23, Peter tells us the power of the Word of God. He shows us that it is the Word of God that brings people to the experience of being born again. Notice he says in chapter 1 verse 23, he says, For you have been born, born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable. And what is that imperishable seed? That is through the living and enduring word of God. 
That is what brings people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, the Word of God. So my question to you, my believing brothers and sisters in Christ, is this. Are you faithfully sharing the Word of God to people who need to hear it and heed it? Are you fully committed to your God-given mission of spreading the good news of Jesus Christ? If not, why not? Because this is why you have this word. It is to spread it, it is to share it, so that others will come to that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, if you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, may I humbly say to you today, you and I are living in a world which is moving toward judgment. My friend, don't be deceived. Things are not going to continue as they are now. The day of God's final judgment is fast approaching. But here is the good news to you. The Bible says God is not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. How did he make that repentance possible? He provided a Savior, Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, to die in your place on the cross for you to receive his salvation, his forgiveness, and his free gift of eternal life. He wants you to pass from death unto life. So today, simply turn to Jesus from your sins. Tell Jesus today that you are a sinner in need of his salvation. And trust Jesus today with childlike faith that he died in your place on the cross for all your sins. That he was buried to put away your sins as far as the east is from the west. And that he rose again on the third day to bring you into a right relationship with the holy and righteous God. And the Bible says the very moment you commit in trust to yourself to Jesus Christ, you will be saved and made a new creation. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message, the reminder of your plan and purpose for the world we live in today. And I thank you, Father God, for your patience that has been demonstrated again and again, over and over, to each one of us here today and in many years of our lives. And Lord, I pray today for my believing brothers and sisters here that your Holy Spirit will stir up our hearts, that we will not fail in our duty, in our mission of spreading and sharing your good news so that others will come into a saving faith with Christ. And now, Lord, I pronounce your blessing upon your people. The Bible says, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. Therefore, repent and live. And all God's people said, Amen.